Welcome to the Matt Waller Podcast, where we look at success at the intersection of technology, logistics, supply chain, retail, and CPG, also known as the retail value chain. I want to clarify that this podcast is distinct from my responsibilities as a professor in the Sam M. Walton College of Business. Nonetheless, it aligns with my aspiration to provide practical insights to professionals and business by showcasing companies and people that can enhance your ability to manage, lead, and strategize and market effectively in the retail value chain. Before we dive into today's exciting episode, I'd like to thank our sponsor, New Road Capital Partners. New Road invests in proven technology, services, and products that serve unmet needs in the marketplace. They look for companies in supply chain and logistics, as well as consumer-oriented companies. For more information, go to newroadcp.com. I would also like to disclose that I am a strategic advisor to New Road. I'd also like to recognize podcastvideos.com for the services they provide for these podcasts. I'm very pleased with their services. And now without further ado, let's get into the exciting episode. I have with me today, Jared Smith, who is the CEO of Kite String Technical Services in Bentonville, Arkansas. He's a expert on POS systems and payment systems, and his company is very interesting. He's been the CEO for 12 years. Um, earlier in his um, career, he got a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, and um, but he now runs an agency of 150 people here in uh, Northwest Arkansas, and it's a very successful uh, professional services firm. I think you're really going to like this uh, discussion. Uh, we actually talk a lot about POS, so if you're interested in retail or technology at all, I think you'll be interested. We talk about a little bit about the history of retail and the future, uh, especially from a POS perspective, and uh, a little bit about omni-channel. And we talk about AI, of course. Uh, every conversation has to include AI to some degree. Uh, but we even talk about things like uh, certain aspects of running a professional services firm. What, what do you need to be good at? What do you need to do? Um, and we talk uh, a little bit also about uh, strategy as well. And so I think you're really going to enjoy this. Um, thank you. Jared, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Matt. I'm glad to be here. Jared, um, I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about your firm, uh, Kite String. Um, what do you do? Um, how do you work? Those kind of things. But first, just describe a little bit about your, your company. All right. Well, we're Kite String Technical Services is our full name, but we, everybody just calls us Kite String. We are a technology consulting firm specializing in retail technology. Um, we're 25 years old, about 150 people or so strong. Um, we have a few different lines of business. Um, so part of our business is fo focused on talent solutions. I can get into the details of that. Part of it is strategic consulting, and then part of it is custom software development. So those are kind of the three things we do, all of it focused in the retail space. So our main kind of historical business has been point of sale software. We've done a lot for integration and customization of existing point of sale software and also building, you know, Greenfield brand new point of sale software. So point of sale, payment systems, e-commerce, asset protection, a lot of back office software is what we've worked on. Pharmacy, another big one for us is retail pharmacy. Regarding those three areas of your business, which one did you start in? We started, well, you know, kind of, we sort of fell into it in that actually my father started the company in 1998, um, he had been, even when I was in junior high, all the way junior high and high school, he would work in point of sale. He actually built a custom point of sale solution and sold it to very small like independent grocers, I think like a, um, a cruise company out of Hawaii. So small small companies like this were using his solution, uh, but it wasn't really you know taking off or anything. And he took a contract with NCR or then ultimately later IBM with to work on Walmart's point of sale system in the late nineties and incorporated a company and that was kind of a route there. And he was he spent years as an independent contractor 
um, working under either an NCR, I think NCR in the beginning, and then later IBM, who owned the 4690 operating system that was later sold to Toshiba. So now you think of Toshiba, that used to be IBM's retail division that owned the 4690 operating system, which is still, I think, today the biggest operating system for cash registers. So he was doing that for maybe two or three years on his own, and then they needed another person to help some big, um, I don't know exactly what they were doing back then, to... Um, I, I believe what they did is purchase the software from Toshiba or from IBM at the time, and they were going to revamp it in a newer language. At the time, I think it was C or C++. So they needed a couple more people. They uh, let my dad do that. So he brought in a couple. So I think our he was the first person in 98. The next person, I think, was 2001. And then two people, uh, one person right after that. So when I got here, so he was just doing that. He was doing work on behalf of Walmart, but for IBM for, you know, 12 years. And I showed up in 2010 and that's what I did. So kind of our roots in retail and you know, typically kind of came from just this. This is what we're doing. I was doing mobile apps um, in the POS space is what I started doing. In 2010. I, in 2010, yeah. So we built uh, the first point of sale app, you know, hand customer held point of sale app um, that later became Scanigo. Wow. So, we're scanning so we did a, we called it a executive checkout because it was only for executives. And I, so I got here in 2010, joined the, I said Northwest Arkansas, joined the company, spent, I don't know, six months building the software. And then I had to go around to different executives offices at Walmart and deploy the, onto their iPhone. And so I brought my laptop and we go in there and put it on there. So everybody got this on their iPhone and we were using it at three stores here locally. So that was kind of a roots. That was my introduction to retail technology. He was building mobile apps for Walmart and this kind of, you know, precursor to Scanigo called Executive Checkout. So did that. And ultimately the natural place for us to keep going was in retail technology. It was what I'd kind of learned. To, I did that. I worked on that for a while now. And then I got into uh, international integration. So as there were different um, international um, acquisitions, I could, I was kind of, Merging those technologies, especially in the POS space, writing middleware to integrate that town technology into the existing back office systems. So learned a lot over probably about a six year period of working in the kind of guts of point of sale payment systems. And that was just a natural sort of jumping off point for the company in terms of the technology. But you, maybe we'll back up here for a second. Yes. What was, what was, I don't know if I addressed your question. I was just, I, I asked uh, of the three areas. Of, you know. Okay, yeah. So that so what it was, us just working on the thing, and we needed people, right, to help us work. Because there were a lot of different things going on in the POS space. Um, it was still all entirely Walmart through the 90s, through the two, early 2000s. And then, in, you know, I came in 2010, and it was, again, just, Individual, so I would call this in the talent solution space. We were finding people that could help build software um, for, at the time, our own one customer was IBM, really. So, I mean, we were second tier to Walmart, and then we really began to branch out in 2012 or so. But we were just finding people. We didn't really have a business model. I think at the time it was just we write code and we get someone to pay us for it. That was it. And then we started really thinking about, you know, my dad left the business in 2012. Um, he retired, and uh, I kind of carried the carried the mess from there and was looking for what is the model, what are we doing, and obviously retail technology is what he had been working on, what I had been working on, seemed like a natural place, and it was finding people to help us build these systems. And I wanted to do, it was easier to do something that was around kind of an agency model, find people to work on these things, build for their time, and you're not, you know, we weren't, I wasn't looking to build custom software, you know, to sell. I was wanting to find, you know, I was wanting to sell services, which were building custom software. So the, when you became CEO in 2012, is that right? Yeah, beginning of 2012. And um, most of the history of the company has been um, POS and payment type systems and um, I was an early adopter of Scan and Go, and I know it changed a lot uh, over the years. And um, and Walmart's integrated all kinds of their quite a few different apps. It seems like into one app, um, but um, 
What do you think is the uh, future of, you know, if you look at Amazon, for example, they used to have the no checkout, right? People would just Mm -hmm. put the things in their cart and leave. They dropped that, I believe. Um, Is that right? Yes. Well, I don't know if they dropped it. There's still a few stores that are doing that, um, but it, it's it's. I don't know if it's feasible for a large store, especially for you know thinking about a super center and like that. So the the places where it has worked um, are like convenience stores and smaller. I believe we have a limited selection of items and a limited um, square footage for those items. So I think that's where those kind of you know you know completely frictionless you know grab and go sort of technology will make sense, but in, in bigger stores. I don't think that's that's where people are headed. And then there's, um, I mean, the self check stands have become so much easier to use than they used to be. Again, I was an early adopter there. Um, I've always liked it. Uh, partially, I was curious as to how it worked, but it used to be there were always problems when you tried to do it. And I know some of the innovation wasn't necessarily with the software. Some of it was, but some of it was with you know, putting barcodes on produce, for example, things like that. Is that right? That's that's some of it. I think users just also just – so I think it was a combination of users getting better at the technology and the software getting better. Because, um, you know, I think most people did start to figure out that, you know, like in the old days, I don't know if this is the case anymore, there was a little bitty barcode on, say, on weighable items like fruit. Right. But that was actually a PLU. And if you'd scan it, it would always just trip up. Like, that would cause a problem because it would go to look What's for What's a PLU? You, uh, I forget what PLU stands for, but it's essentially how you would identify um, weighable items. Oh, okay. Got it. So limes, bananas, tomatoes, whatever will have a PLU number associated with them. And you could, I used to know them. Like, a few of them that I, I would know by hand, you could just key them in, it would bring up bananas and you'd weigh them. So that's kind of what a... You know, you'll see a, like usually a chart where they're looking to see bananas and looking at the PLUs, or the lemons. And looking right. At the PLUs, yeah. But not the same as a barcode. So right. If you scan that, that will all, they would often get mis- mistaken and go look for the UBC. And there wasn't a UBC, and it would then require uh, associate intervention, which makes the whole experience really not worthwhile. Anytime a associate has to come over there and get it re- restarted for you. So I think people have gotten better about what they can scan, what they can't scan. And, this, you don't need associated intervention near as often. Things like even like restricted items like alcohol. You'd scan alcohol, it would freeze, and you had to wait for somebody to come over and check your ID. Now there's a associated intervention will be delayed, and it can come later. So you scan the item, you can keep going, and then at some point they'll come over and check your ID. So those little things, like I remember when I first started using it, I had to sit there and wait to show my ID to someone before I could scan my second item or my next item. And now you can just keep going and keep going, and we'll sh- show up during that experience. So it's gotten better. But, I mean, I read an article, I believe yesterday, about a, a store. I think it was a Walmart taking um, a bunch of self-checkouts out in a, I forgot the state, but it was a, maybe, I want to say Mississippi or somewhere. That, but, you know, it was it made the retail news that they were removing all self-checkouts. So I think it's still a work in progress of whether customers like self-checkouts and whether they're something, a positive impact on retailers in general it's probably a mix i would guess it is a mix and i think it's, it's really hard you know when you if you're a retailer trying to figure out i mean your biggest thing is you want to get customers through checkout quickly take their money quickly that's you know kind of the motto of point of sales take their money quickly and it's not clear where the right place to do that is you know people don't like to check out lines but honestly that's the, usually the fastest way if there's not a line is to go through to a you know a checker who knows what to do, knows to grab your items and how to bag those items, and it's a much quicker process than you doing it yourself. But if you only have a small number of items, it's, it's much faster to go. So it kind of depends on the specific cart, the that particular shopping trip and things like that, whether you want to use a self-checkout or use a traditional checkout. So I think they'll probably always have a mix where you can depend on that particular shopping experience whether you want to go to a self-checkout route or you want to go to the man lane. Well, I, I noticed that, um, you know, on the self-checkout stands, now they're having advertise, advertisements on them. It's part of the retail media network mm-hmm. strategy. So 
You know, if you're a supplier, um, you can advertise on their app, on their website, uh, audio in the store, uh, other places, screens Gas in stores. <laughs> What's that? Gas pumps. Gas pumps, yeah. And and but also the self check stand. Mm-hmm. I've not seen that one, but absolutely makes sense. So it's interesting how the marketing and business processes themselves are really colliding a little bit. You know, and it, it it makes the trade offs and the decisions even more complicated. Sure. I mean, but ultimately, if you're trying, if your 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 ultimate goal is a good customer experience, um, and a good customer experience in a retailer is you generally uh, checkout part is not the exciting part. No, you just you want to get that done with scan your items and get out. So it's really hard to say because the handheld, yeah, you know, we've gone through many iterations. Different here, you know, whether you have a, a retailer own scanner on the say the, the cart. Yeah, I mean, I've seen you, those. You pick those up and scan yourself. Well, that's not a great solution because you often don't know you don't shop in the same order you'd want a bag. So then you just. Put all the items in there, and then you gotta you gotta stop and bag them all up at the end. Hmm. Or you can carry your own bags and kind of bag as you go. It's not ideal. We haven't really found the, the solution for you know grab and go where you're just getting usually three or four items. It doesn't really matter, um, right? How you bag it, you can just put them in your backpack or whatever. But when you're doing a, a full grocery shopping, you generally want to just put it in your cart and then bag it afterwards in the proper way where the eggs are going to be on top or the bread's going to be on top and you're going to have the meat and heavier things on the bottom. Well, that's a role. And there's to even have any customer held device will be challenging the way. So it's just, it's hard to figure out what's the best customer experience. And that's a lot of things we do in our strategic portion of our business is help with those things. You know, what's the best customer experience for checkout? How do you do that? How do you analyze that? Uh, we typically approach it with a, a, a kind of framework we call, or we didn't invent this framework. I think it was Clayton Christensen, someone like this, jobs to be done. So that we use the jobs to be done framework to kind of approach, like, what are the jobs that the customers are trying to get done? And what are the jobs the associates are trying to get done? And we kind of analyze that by talking to all the different stakeholders, doing store visits, to try and best understand What's what's going to you know maximize customer experience and what's going to maximize associate experience because you want to optimize both of those two things to to get the your, your best possible shopping experience. Clayton Christensen was a professor at Harvard and prolific writer, really interesting. Um, he wrote the book. The only book I read that he wrote was called Innovator's Dilemma, yes, yes. which is a great book. Um, I, I read it, but that's the yeah, that's kind of. I didn't know. We started doing, so one of our lead designer, um, he was the one who kind of brought this jobs to be done approach to doing the work we're doing in terms of customer experience and, you know, user experience at, at retailers. And uh, I wasn't sure where it came from. So I, he told me about it and I started looking into it and discovered there that, you know, the framework is, you know, often associated with Clayton Christians. So, um you know, there's also people are buying online and picking up at store. And so the associates are doing some of the in-store shopping for the shopper. Yes. Yeah, Bopus, <laughs> I think BOPUS or buy online, pick up in store has been a huge transformation and will continue to accelerate over time. Because that, I mean, almost anyone will tell you that's, a, that's the best experience, particularly for grocery. Not necessarily the experience you want for apparel or other categories, but for grocery, we kind of all know what we want. And and, and it's it's all kind of commodity at this point. You know, you, you know what milk you want, what eggs you want. You know, you're just so you put those down and having them either deliver straight to your house or put in the trunk of your car when you pull up is it's a fantastic experience. So like many of us here in Northwest Arkansas, I I would say exclusively shop that way. You know, I have Walmart Plus and I'm sure a lot of other people do where you can get free delivery when you need it, or you can, you know, always do pickup. And, and you also get ten percent or ten cents off on your gas. Yeah, you get a few things like that. So, interesting story here. Going back to the early day roots, one of the first, ex, you know, examples of Bopus was actually uh, the Alaskan Bush Pilot Project we did in the '90s at Walmart, where the Walmart in Alaska, well, they were trying to get items out to more rural places. And they kind of came up with an ordering system, and then they could put the items onto a plane to fly these out. So I've had a few of my, this is obviously 
predates me. I was at the company at the time, but uh, one of our older associates told me about the Alaskan Bush Pilot Project that we worked on, and then online, you know, different kind of you know buy online and pick up in store iterations that go back to the early two thousands, were things that Kitestream worked on in the early early days. So we've been kind of in that Opus space, or you know, buying online since you know. Well, so it's just Walmart.com came online in 2000. I believe. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, but some of it predates 2000 because I think the Alaskan Bush Pilot, Alaskan Bush Pilot Project, even predated the the internet, or at least predated the World Wide Web. The, the, the uh, Walmart.com, which is I think 2000 or so. Yeah, which is close to the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so, the Bush Pilot thing. I don't know all the details. Okay. I, I probably, I will, that's about all the details I have right there is it was a really early iteration of this idea of buying online. Um, and, but they weren't, be, they weren't directly picking up on store. It was kind of just how do you, how does a customer get their items without, um, without going into the store? Right. It's kind of an early iteration. And then it kind of gained, I forgot what we called this, the second iteration, which was more in the kind of, mid 2000s was you would get on walmart.com and you could get it shipped i think it was just called ship to store and you shipped to store so that was a big project we worked on um and my father worked on it was ship to store and you'd go back to the customer service area at the back of the store and pick up your items there as opposed to having them shipped to your house i believe this was before shipping was free you know everything was free shipping now but it didn't start that way and so you could have it shipped to the store i think for free so these kind of iterations have been going, I mean, things like this have been going around since the nineties and, you know, and where it is today, it's just getting, it's more and more convenient and it's accelerating at all, all the time. The technology that an associate might use to pick for a shopper that's done by online pickup at store obviously has to deduct the unit from the perpetual inventory system, I would think. Mm -hmm. Does it, would it deduct it when they pick it or once it's bought online or do you know? I don't know for sure. I would imagine it's once it's picked. Once it's picked because they're scanning the items. I've seen them there or another. It's not just while we're at, like at Meyer or other grocery chains. You've seen them doing this where they pick up the items, scan them and create the card, then send it out to your car. I would imagine they would deduct that there. But it's an interesting question of when you think about online sales versus store sales, you know, you, you know, omni-channel really blends those two. Where it does. Is that an online sell? You know, I buy things all the time where get online, buy it on the website, and then it shows up on my porch like the same day, sometimes within like an hour because it happened to be in the store, the local store, and someone could just bring it over. Well, who's, you know, from an accounting standpoint, is that an online purchase or is that a store-based purchase? You know, I think... Those are kind of interesting ways to, you know, omni-channel is just, it's a, it's a whole new world, I think. It is. And, you know, I've heard people say, you know, right now omni-channel is a new thing, and it's different than just brick and mortar or just e-commerce. It's integrating the two. But, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, it's not going to be long before we're just saying commerce because these are just different channels yeah. of distribution. Um but they're not easy to execute, um, and they also require customer education. Um, you know, I think about uh, where you can buy online and have it drone delivered as well, and that's getting rolled out bigger in, in the Dallas area uh, soon. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's other kinds of complications there in terms yeah. of yeah. customer, and not, not only with the customer, but of course with the FAA and many other things. Yeah, I mean... A lot. So I think. I mean, Walmart's good at this. Amazon's good at this of trying a lot of new things. I mean, yes. And some of this, I would probably argue, is innovation theater, and not necessarily like practical solutions for retailers going forward. And a lot of people don't have the, even if it is practical solutions for retailers, or a lot of retailers don't have the capabilities, right? The the financial capital to do drone delivery and and you know grab and go, sort of just grab yourself and walk out kind of things because it's such a huge technical investment. So I think realistically it's going to be, you know, the future of retail is not, I don't think going to be necessarily drone flying all over the floor. I think, I think it will cause so many problems and so many retailers won't be able to 
wouldn't be able to do that, but, you know, getting an item just, I, one of the things I heard, uh, I mean, this is just reading in the news from a few years back, uh, and I, I see this occasionally where Walmart associates, when they're getting off work, um, can drop an item off on their way. So they, they plug, you know, they, I think first enlist and they say, here's where I live. You know, this is my home. I'm going to drive from the store I'm working at to there. And they'll say, well, on your route home, there's potential for dropping some items off. I don't know if they're still doing that program, but things like that, where it's a very convenient Makes sense. There's the, the lift is pretty low. You know, if the, the associates already driving home. You're not buying the infrastructure of a drone or, or anything like that. So I think those kind of solutions that any, that are accessible to almost any retailer are going to be the ones that went out. What are some of the advancements you see coming in POS over the next few years? I think what people want is to scan their items quickly, right? So, I, I, you know, putting that on the customer side, you know, like uh, self-checkout does, isn't a great solution, especially when you have a large um, cart. You know, when you have, let's say, 20 items or more cart, that's going to be a challenging solution. you got to bag them yourselves, and you might not want to bag them yourself. And, and you might say, well, why am I having to do this? And so, you know, is the, is the associate or is the retailer going to pay me $10 an hour to back my own stuff while I do that. So I think what you want is to be able to get through really quickly. And, and I think technologies like RFID and computer vision, where you can identify the item and ring it up very, very quickly, um, as opposed to the current of putting uh, you know, a linear belt on in each item on its own, would be some nice ways of getting... I mean, we're still going to go to the grocery store, I think, and, or order online and get them shipped to, for a long, long time. These are going to be the solutions, but I believe that checking out quickly by using either computer vision or RFID, I think solutions like this where you can quickly identify the item and charge the customer without having to have all the innovation of grabbing and scanning the UPC. With RFID, I don't know if this is still an issue, but it used to be that you know, if you had something that had water in it or metal, uh, which is polar, it would mess up the signal from the yeah, that's still it's still an it's still, a, still a challenge um but you know but computer vision is getting really it is as, as we all it's know, remarkable it's getting remarkable so the ability to identify items now the problem with computer vision is that you could obviously disguise you know you can hide things in the sh- a shopping cart so if you can't see it you can't but with rfid you could potentially identify items so i think there's still some challenges even with computer vision and if you have a very full shopping cart, what's in the middle of that shopping cart? Can't right. So even if you have 360 degrees of camera, there's still going to be items you won't be able to see. And if you can't see it, you can't bring it up. Do you think that there might be some sort of triangulation, if you will, between RFID and vision? Yeah, I think. So it feels like you can run statistical models here to me. What I was like, you know, you kind of know what's in the shopping cart. Now, this seems weird to say um, I'm going to take an average of what should be in your shopping cart based on what I see from computer vision or maybe with RFID and then figure out what the typical cart would look like and compare the, you know, the prices I'm getting from a computer vision to what I expect weight, you know, thing I've always wondered if you, you know, you should from a categorization model, be able to figure out what all your items should weigh. And then if you say, well, this is what computer vision is telling me it weighs and this is what it actually weighs because you maybe have a scale on the way out. So I think there's some things you could do to augment computer vision. You see certain things, then you use some kind of statistical model or categorization model to tell you what should be there or what you might be missing and give it like an average price or something like that. I'd like to talk a little bit about your agency. Okay. And, um, you know, running a business like you're running, you've got 150 employees. Is that right? Somewhere around there. Yeah. And um, it's hard to find people. Um, it's hard to uh, retain people. Um, Have you found that to be true? For sure. For I mean, particularly, I mean, that got much more acute starting in um, 2020. Starting out of the pandemic, we saw. I mean, the Great Resignation was real. Um, When you and it's really related to almost most economists. I think already understand this. When you have a lot of job openings relative to job seekers. And you get an imbalance where there's many, many job openings for each job seeker. Say that there's three, four, five, even six job openings per job seeker. You'll start getting 
I mean, this is a natural consequence. We start seeing more and more turnover. And so the great resignation that we saw really accelerate in 2021 was a result of having just a lot of options, particularly for technology folks. There were a lot of jobs out there. So we saw the same thing. So retaining people is just challenging. And then a remote world, I used to compete with firms in Arkansas. And then start, starting in 2020, I'm competing with Google because <laughs> they can hire, you know, I've had people go to Tesla, go to Google, go to Microsoft, and they didn't, they stayed in their house living in Northwest Arkansas, just took a new job. So that completely changed the competitive landscape, at least for talent. Um, good for them, harder for us, you know, because now I was losing employees who didn't want to move to California, didn't want to move to Washington, but now can stay right where they were and just take a different job. So it, it just changed the landscape considerably in terms of re retaining talent. When you, uh, as CEO of, of this um, agency, um, you're, you know, you've got a vision as a company and a mission and a strategic direction. But we're also in a time of great flux, especially in technology, because of different types of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and um, many other things that are out there, generative AI. Um, how do you, you know, I, I know you're working, you have customers that, clients that come to you and say, we want to build this. But then it's part of your responsibility, I would imagine, to say, well, here are some new technologies we might want to consider as we build this. Yeah. Or just, is this the right thing to build? Is it the right thing to build? Yeah. How do you work with clients on those kinds of things? I mean, generally, I mean, it's not, especially in retail, it's not always going to be the latest and greatest. You don't necessarily want to be implementing every new trend. I mean, you don't want bleeding edge technology. Yeah. And it's just, you know, AI is a great example. I mean, AI, I believe, is a transformative technology. It's going to transform the human experience. But it's also a bubble, total bubble right now. And you never know. I mean, it's, go back to the dot-com yeah. bubble, right? Oh, yeah. It transformed the human experience. It did. The internet did, but it was still a bubble. So we have a bubble right now, and no one really knows what's going to shake out, what's going to be the right solutions and what aren't. And I don't think retailers, especially in the point-of-sale space, are going to be jumping into the latest and greatest trends just to find out that's not really the direction it's going. So they're going to be more cautious, and they, they should be, in my estimation. A lot of times, POS technology will last for 15 and 20. You know, you implement a POS, at least from a software standpoint, once you implement something, you want to keep it there for a while. You don't want to be changing out your point of sale software all the time. That's just too disruptive. It's, you know, you can easily brick a store. You know, if your POS goes down, you have a store that can do nothing. You know, many, your inventory system can have problems. Your tax system can have problems. There's a lot of systems that go down and you can still sell a line. But if POS goes down, you're just a, you're just a very expensive brick. So I think they don't want to be always on the bleeding edge with at this way. So I would suggest that they shouldn't be on the bleeding edge with this stuff. So you're right. POS is critical for the retailer. It's also critical for the suppliers and it's critical for the shoppers. So it's a really important system. How safe or robust are they to cybersecurity issues? Generally, pretty safe. I mean, there was the the, the target. That's what I was thinking. Was the, the biggest one in that was when was that? Probably 2014, maybe. I can't it remember. It was. It's been a while. It was a know, big probably news ten item. Ago, ten years ago, it was big news. And my understanding is that came into an HVAC system. Yeah, that's what I've heard. It, but, uh, you know. So retailers got rid of all their H of X. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know the details of exactly the hack, except that it came in through some kind of HVAC, HVAC software system. Why a uh, point of sale or payment system had any connection to theirs. So generally, you know, it's all cordoned off with the PC, PCI environment. I think the HVAC connection is they want cold cash. And so, no, sorry. <laughs> um, it's cordoned off in a PCI environment. And typically, at least, you know, historically, the software is kind of like security by obfuscation. You know, we're using like mean, the number one operating system for point of sale is the 4690 operating system owned by Toshiba. Uh, well, I think number two would be the NCR's operating system. Like it's, 
you know, the reason why you know, Microsoft is the most hacked system is it's the most widely known system. People can, you know, not many people have 4690 to sit around and figure out how to hack. So I think there's there's some certain things that we use very, re- what we call retail hardened operating systems mm-hmm. that are going to be very challenging to hack and are not prevalent anywhere out in the world outside of point of sale. Like there are specific point of sale operating systems. Now that's kind of changing and people are starting to use, you know, typical Android operating systems and, and Linux operating systems for, I mean, I don't, and there's a few using even Microsoft's operating system in the POS space, but they have to be, you know, they're, they're pretty locked down and this is not, especially with things like point to point encryption, which I think when the Walmart hack, or sorry, the um, target hack happened, um, point to point encryption was not, you know, so P2P has really, you know, it's widespread and it, and has been since, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we worked on this stuff back in, let's say, 2015, 2016. What does point-to-point encryption mean? When you're at the pin pad, you know, you're going to interact with the pin pad, you're usually going to swipe your card or things like that. Point-to-point encryption means it's encrypted at that point and going to be transferred over to the register. As a, at all points, it's going to remain encrypted. That was not always the standard. So point-to-point encryption means you're encrypting the credit card information right there at the pin pad. Got it. And that's made it more secure. So point-to-point encryption, um, PCI standards. I mean, PCI standards are about to change again. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to keep. Remind me of PCI standards. For uh, all credit card information oh, okay. or something like this. P- P- you know, I don't quote me on that, but it's something yeah. like that. It's essentially talking about credit card information. So, Got it. You know, when you're storing, when you're giving your credit card to a retailer, they're storing that. So they destroy all the transaction information, but it has to be encrypted and stored in a safe way. And, and a lot of the, and they have to be kept in a cordoned off network called the PCI environment. And the, these kind of things have mostly kept one itself safe where it's not as vulnerable to malicious activity as like, especially e-commerce and the internet. Yeah. So, okay. But in some ways the e-commerce purchasing is also a key part of this. Um, is it as encrypted and safe as uh, POS? Well, um, I believe so. I mean, I'm certainly getting outside of, you know, over my skis, out over my skis here in terms of my understanding of encryption. So typically I think SSL encryption or whatever the standard for encryption is when you put your credit card information into a retailer would be similar to the encryption level that you would get at a, Pin pad, you know, there's some kind of I don't know whether it's 16 bit or 32 bit or some kind of or, you know sophisticated encryption algorithm that that encrypts that, and then it still has to send it over the internet, but it's going to send it over the in- internet encrypted. Um, so I think even the online purchases are relatively safe, but certainly in the store, you know how we how they avoid hacks in the store is is pretty much a PCI environment. Clearly, if you're the PCI environment in the store, so clearly if you're buying it from home, you're outside the BTI environment when you put your credit card information in, but that's encrypted there on your computer and then sent over uh, a secure socket to get to the retailer. So um, one other thing that this brings up, so one thing that we're discussing here is just how important the point of sale system is um, in so many ways, right? It's, it's the, the even, you know, even the most, you know, Walmart's done a great job of diversifying into dot com and so you know but it's still i believe going to be 90 plus percent of their revenue i don't, I don't know so I, you know but most retailers are going to be 90 to 95 percent of all of their revenues i come through a cash register so it's still a huge deal it's a critical thing and will be for a long time it, it, it's hard to imagine a world where i mean unless brick and mortars you know if, if you go the amazon route and go completely e-commerce but you know there's a lot of things that won't work particularly with with you know soft soft items and grocery and, and and apparel, I think it's still, you know, most people will still want to go to apparel in person. Um, that's going to come through a point of sale device. So um, here's a thought. You know, we're, we have a situation in the United States where we have something like 60% of the grid is past its 50, uh, 50-year life expectancy. We have growing demand for electricity. It's growing rapidly. And AI and um, other technologies are causing a lot of this growth. Mm -hmm. But some of it's being um, 
stimulated by government policies to electrify transportation, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, um, and, and at the same time, there's policies that are coming down the line that are going to reduce some of our current sources of electricity. So you have two things going on that hurt us from an electric system perspective. And some of the things I've read are predicting more and more, there's already some of it going on in some states, more and more rolling blackouts and these kinds of things. Um, so my question is, if you know, if point of sale is so important, and it is, you, you want to protect it from uh, cyber attacks, uh, you want to make sure it's up and running and doesn't need to crash and uh, that it's easy to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how much thought is given by retailers to the energy for it? Well, I think that would be most like, can your store run during blackouts when powered out? And most can. They're going to have generators to run. And, 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 you know, you might not be connected to the network, but can you still sell an item when your store is gone dark? Um, you have you'll have internal power from generators, and can you still sell items? That would be a concern with a fully cloud-based point of sale system. For example, you don't you know a lot of you are kind of would back off the idea of doing a fully cloud-based thing because if their store is down, they can't so if the network's right. down, they can't sell anything. So infrastructure problem. So in terms of the electric grid, I've not had heard many retailers concerned about problems with the electric grid. I do know, and I've been in stores when the power goes down. Um, usually from a storm more than from roll, but I lived in California for years where we had rolling blackouts or rolling brownouts, I think they called them. Um, and you know, you have generators that you have to keep, <laughs> keep, you know, powered up and that runs the registers and the lights and keeps, keeps things going. Now, I think they're going to go to a, usually you won't necessarily have, if the whole item file is not stored locally, you won't necessarily, there could be potentially some items you can't sell, but if you can sell the vast majority of your items, you're, you're generally are going to be okay with that. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is, um, you know, sometimes a supplier will sell two different bags of potato chips. I'm just using this as an example. They're different bags. They have the same size, exact same contents, but the bags are different because it's maybe a part of a promotion or whatever. The barcodes don't distinguish between the two of them. And so it's difficult for the supplier to understand, you know, what was the impact of the different package, for example. But I've heard, and I want to know what you think about this. Uh, well, I think you were, you did you go to the uh, Supply Chain Trends Conference that Plug and Play had? No. I did not. So they had um, the senior VP of, customer supply chain for PepsiCo okay. was a speaker. And one, uh, one of the things that he talked about was he thinks the UPC is going to go away and be replaced by something else. I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, but it allows for greater um, uh, specialization yep. like this. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I've run into the same thing when we were building apps. You know, we would we were – we had to build actually – because in early days we actually had to build a UPC scanner because they didn't exist back then. This kind of early early enough days that you could couldn't just download one off off the app store. So we had to build one custom to scan a UPC and then go hit a, a UPC service, and you would realize you would get multiple items back. It was really, so I exactly remember this problem of you having to distinguish which item is the one you're talking about because sometimes UPC is not enough. Um, now I didn't know saying if we had a solution. I just I'm, I'm familiar with the problem of UPC not being granular enough to tell you exactly what's happening in terms of an item level. Um, I, well, I don't know if I can offer. Any no, no, that's that. that's good. I I know uh, he he showed us some examples where you know you could it, it's like a QR code, so you could scan it and you could see what ingredients were in it, why they were in there, et cetera, et cetera. But you could also distinguish between very granular details sure. about the product. Yeah. I mean, you can encode significantly more information on a two-dimensional barcode than you can on a one-dimensional barcode. So I would imagine that could be a way of, of getting more granular information, but I, it's not something I'm pretty familiar with. So back to the 
um, agency discussion. We got back into the sure. POS discussion because it's yeah. interesting. More, yeah, more POS and retail than I've talked about in a long time. So, so um, you know, um, with running an agency, uh, we, we were talking about, you know, retailers don't necessarily want to be on the bleeding edge. They want good POS. Reliab- reliability, I think, is just really important. Reliability is very important, and, and we talked about that. Um, reliability is a complicated idea because it not only is based on the technology, but the business process and the users, mm-hmm. and those, and probably other things I'm not thinking of. How do you think through those kinds of well, things? We, I, we have a whole team that does exactly this. They go in. We'll have a team of probably four or five people. Um, when our, particularly when a retail or retailer is wanting to do some kind of technology transformation or modernization in their POS space, we have a team that will a consulting team. Where this on the you know I talked about the three lines of business. This is on the strategy consulting side. We'll go work with the retailer to help them think through these problems about you know, talking to all the different stakeholders, walking around inside of a store, understanding exactly what they want to accomplish and helping them sort of think through that. Because a lot of times if you're a, a retailer and even if you're in the technology division of a retailer, you've probably had the same point of sale system since you arrived or got your job there, you know. And ultimately you don't necessarily know what you don't know about how to go get a new one and what what's the, the greatest, latest and greatest in terms of technology. And, you know, you might not want to go to the latest and greatest, but... What's the what's the best solution out there to do what I need? And so you need to go kind of ask them, what do you need? What's specific? Are you want and what kind of retailer are you? Are you a, a convenience store? Or are you a department store? Or you, you know, are you a club? You know, a club format or something like that. And each one of those are going to have different needs, and we'll talk to the different stakeholders, users, customers, do store visits to understand and hopefully lay out a plan for them to to help them in a really kind of regimented way to get from point A to point Z eventually. Um, this is one of the problems we've seen is, you know, especially in this space, because it's such a critical piece of software that analysis paralysis can kind of take over for a retailer where they don't, you know, there's a lot of things they want to do and they, there's this could solve it, this could solve it, and maybe this will solve it. So we've been able to really accelerate things by coming in and saying, we have a very clear process. So you do this, do this, do step one, step two, step three to get you from where you are to where you have actually selected your new software. And then hopefully we're going to be the ones to come in and integrate that software into your system. So you build software for other companies. Mm -hmm. And have you ever been tempted to build software for yourselves? Not really, a little bit, but not really. It's not, the product space is not, has never been all that attractive to me as a, as just a, business person entrepreneur like I don't what I sit on the board of a product company um, software company so I, I, I understand the space and nothing wrong with it and there's you know everybody kind of always talks about this idea of you know, build it once and software build it once and sell it over and over and over it, it's never that simple no <laughs> it's not even close and I like that this the simplicity of the agency model where you're selling essentially time um is, is simple and lower risk in a way that I, I, that's really attractive. Okay, now I'm going to come back to AI again. Okay. We were talking about AI earlier in the context of your cus- your customers uh, adopting sure. it, right? But, but there's also, um, as an agency, mm-hmm. um, you can adopt it to become more efficient. Is, is, do you think that's very viable? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, did I send you? I think I sent you this HBR review. You did. Okay, it was so, great. I loved it. Yeah, on, it, was the, it was the consulting study. Yeah, where they, you know, see you. consultants great. get twenty five percent more efficient. So just just for the listener, it would be a, it was a study put out by HBR. Um, I think it was Boston Consulting Group um, working on sort of you know it, it wasn't with a real customer. It was sort of made up problems. And they use a, a one big group without um, a, a, AI and one group with AI. And those that were using AI saw uh, across the board 25% increase in efficiency and productivity. And as you pointed out, I think the more junior people had saw even a, a bigger increase in productivity. Um, the 
senior folks saw only a, a marginal. It was like 17 Yes, yeah, a marginal uptick, but still they saw a productivity increase. So absolutely, that service, you know, agencies can, you know, service models or agencies or whatever you want to call them, can leverage AI to deliver value to their customers in new and, and, and better ways. And also just how we run our own business. You know, I still have finance and operations and all kinds of internal aspects to my business. And if I can le- leverage AI there, I can potentially reduce costs and do things in- internal to my own business to make it better, make it more productive, make it more profitable. So, and and how can I leverage it in providing service to customers? So I think there's two different ways I could use we can leverage AI. So, um, and it is interesting. Um, that was a great article, very interesting. And yeah, I I felt like the thing that really struck me was you can take, because they, they randomly sampled people to be in the test group and the control group. And, you know, so it allowed them to have a distribution of performance levels, nominal performance levels. And, you know, the group in the bottom percentile could become as productive as the group in the top yeah. percentiles. That's quite remarkable. Absolutely. Uh, I love that. Um, but we're talking about the bubble, too, in AI. That's very interesting. I I think of AI in terms of, you know, there's the, the hardware uh, to do the training of the AI. There's the cloud services. There's the um, large language model uh, companies that, uh, you know, uh, some are doing um, open AI and some are doing closed AI, although open AI is doing closed AI, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but, uh, but then on top of that, there's the real specialized AI where they're training it on specialized data sets rather than just general data sets. And, yeah. Um, so those are the four areas in some ways. Which I think is key, having the you know, subset of large language models that are trained and, and you know, for specific problems. You know, so if you're a, a company in the, let's say, a retailer and you want to have, you, you know, using, you're, you're already going to be probably weary of using a chat GPT or, or, or Anthropic or something like that. But if you could build one that was, you know, specifically for you, that's, I think, really meaningful where it knew you could treat, you know, you have a lot of data as a retailer and you could feed all that data into the L, your own LLM or a subset LLM that knew all about, and you could ask it questions, financial questions, forecasting questions, and it can tell you, and there's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's essentially just for you. I think that's kind of these, that's the direction a lot of people are trying to go is build a subset LLMs for particular, for specific companies. Or for specific sectors. Yeah, the the general LLMs, apparently, that might be where the big bubble is um, because so much was poured into them and there's no way to put a moat around it, if you will. Uh, you yeah, know. I mean, a lot of our customers will, you know, will sit, have sent out alerts, do not, do not have any of our developers, you know, ever, you know, at, at least while they're at work using any of these LLMs. They don't want to be uploading code because they're worried about the security risk right uploading code or uploading yeah. their their you know ip to an llm that's going to train on it or predictably get hacked or you know no one really knows how you know how secure the data is and you know, some of this is a little bit opaque so there's some fear about the security aspect of using the big open l you know the big large language models like open ai you know switching gears a little bit um so you you're a very successful CEO of this of Kite String and the company's doing really well um, and you're, you're you have 150 people it's a lot to manage uh, you're in an environment where it's hard to hire people hard to retain people uh, technology's moving quickly um, and you know as the as a leader really. I think this is true for everybody, but particularly for a leader, it's important for you to take care of yourself. And I know um, you and I <laughs> see each other at the gym every day at Blake Street House, and um, I know that you not only do cardio exercise and um, you uh, you do strength exercises and you do heat treatment 
and you do the cold plunge. I knew you'd bring up the cold plunge. <laughs> I had to, right? <laughs> this is something uh, for those listening we have in common. Uh, we like to the trendiest thing in the <laughs> it's, it is trendy. <laughs> I'm a little ashamed, but I love it. Well, I do too. I mean, I think I, I'd like to know your thoughts, but uh, and you also monitor your sleep and so forth. These are things we that I do as well. Um, and, um, but you know, the days, if, if I'm exercising regularly and sleeping well at night, especially when I'm not traveling, um, and then I do the heat treatment and the cold plunge, the cold plunge in particular, for some reason has a short term effect on me. It makes me very alert. I could never mean that. Does, yeah. does it YouTube? Yeah, me too. So, I mean, all of this, I'll say, stems from, at least I'll speak for me personally, like I don't always deal with stress the best in, in my job. And I think this is, you know, anyone's job, there's nothing special about my job versus anyone else's, but job can be stressful. Um, but, you know, feeling responsible for the whole company can be stressful. So it's, to me, fun, you know, exercise is such a great outlet. Um, and then the cold plunging, the, you know, all that sort of things are a good outlet where I feel like I'm taking care of myself and I'm sleeping better. Uh, it all kind of, I think, makes me better at my job. That I'm taking care of myself, that I'm getting good sleep, try to eat right. All those things makes me a little bit, you know, a little bit more alert, a little bit better at what I'm doing, a little more thoughtful. Um, I think it's kind of where to, what I'm getting to, trying to get to. Well, there's so much research to back that up. Um, I just like it. I'm not even reading, spending that much time. You know, I know you mentioned Andrew Huberman. I'm not spending that much time looking into what are the benefits. And I just kind of do what feels nice. And going to the gym every day, like, I almost get to where I don't feel great. Like, I can tell if I miss a day. Me too. Like, I don't, I kind of just want to go. And even if it's just go and do a little bit of yoga or so. I did a Pilates class the other day. Um, doing something makes me feel like my day is going to be better. Yeah. Just, you know. Well, there there is research that shows like for sleep, if you if you get short on uh, REM sleep, which typically happens before you wake up, and so to get it, you need to make sure you sleep plenty long, um, it increases um, your perception of anxiety and makes it harder for you to control yourself from reacting you know, uh, and, and for those of you that don't listen, or that haven't been the CEO of an agency, but, um, you know, Jared just said that it's stressful, but all jobs are stressful. And I think there's truth to that, but I've I've uh, run organizations before, and there's nothing that compares to the stress of running the organization. I, I would agree. I have more stress doing this, you know. I mean, I'm not working at all you know, an oil platform or something. <laughs> there's, there's certainly harder jobs than what I have. Um, and I, and I, I love what I do, but it can, it can weigh on you a little bit when you're, you know, got, you know, you're the 150 families that are, you know, you got to make good decisions to kind of keep the, keep things going. And I think that can be particularly difficult and has led to many sleepless nights. So things like, you know, stay, you know, not getting enough sleep, like I can tell the next day I'm just not, Me too. you know, I'm, I'm not the same. I'm not going to be as good of a decision maker. I might be more irritated about how, you know, and if I approach things from an irritated or annoyed standpoint, just because I didn't have enough sleep, I'm probably going to make worse decisions. So I think getting my exercise and getting my sleep is just makes me probably a better decision maker. And it makes life more enjoyable too. For sure. There's also a really, I mean, you're a great example of this. It's a, there's a good social aspect. There is, but yeah. I see a lot of people. I meet a lot of people that, you know, kind of see the same cast of characters at the, the gym every morning. So I kind of like that too. Yeah, we our friendship grew out of running into each other yeah. there, which we probably wouldn't have met otherwise. Absolutely. You know. Um, what advice? So if you take someone, maybe they have experience working in a professional services firm of some sort, and they're thinking about, starting an agency of their own in in whatever area it could be marketing could be uh logistics it could be anything um but based on your experience uh 
and running a professional services firm, what advice would you give them? First of all, it's especially in the services space, the, the, the barrier to entry is lower. Um, you can obviously often do this on the side of your desk. You don't have to necessarily quit your job to go do this. Um, you know, with, with a product company, especially a software product, where you're going to have to stop and spend months, if not years, building a, a, a you know, ready for prime time piece of software that somebody will pay for. Um, that's going to take a lot of time, effort, and you know, but a service, you can just sort of figure out what. And, and I think what's important here is it's surprising what people will pay for. There's a lot of things, you know, I, I, there's a business model that I think is really important in the service space, just the uh, RTFM, I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. Read the freaking manual. Uh, <laughs> so you read the manual, you understand how, let's say open AI APIs. Everybody's wanting to use, you know, there's the, the interface that you've all used where you just type it directly in there. But using the APIs and then agents and things like that, there's a lot of stuff you can do here. And there's so much information on the internet of how to, you know, say do you know, an agent-based workflow and use these APIs, um, you can learn all of that just by reading the manual. Hey, this might be YouTube these days. It's not a, a physical medium. Right. You read these things and a lot of people haven't, you know, it's there. They could go read it, but they haven't had the time to go figure this out. You can go figure out things that are meaningful, especially in with AI, and just sell services around that. I'll help you build an agent-based workflow or something like that. And and that's a service and you got it. You just, you just had to spend... Nights and weekends learning by watching some YouTube videos or reading. I mean, this is, I, I believe it was who's, um, Mark Cuban. This is kind of, yeah. he was, was reading the manual and going and doing the things that he read the manual for companies that didn't want to take the time to read the manual. Interesting. So I, I think the idea that you have to have some brilliant thing that no one's ever thought of is, I'd say, not true at all. I agree with you on just that. Just go find something that is needed. And sometimes just reading, because reading the manual is harder than it sounds. Sometimes it can take many sure. hours, and people have busy days, and it's not clear, especially in a large organization, whose job it is to go read the manual, figure out how to do whatever, interact with a you know an LLM through its API, or what you know. That's just one example of, of many. Who's supposed to go do that? And if you go do that and say, "I can, I can help you," um, for an hourly rate, and then you're doing it, and now you have you have a business, and it's just one, and you can do a business. But just one person in services. And that's really meaningful. You can do it with others. And then you can add a second person when it's time to add a second person. You can add a third person. You never you don't need funding. You don't need much. Um, the only reason you'd ever need funding at all is because you wanted to maybe leave your job a little bit earlier and you weren't quite comfortable with the salary you could make through your services. You wanted to go get a few more customers. You could use a little bit of funding to go a little bit earlier. But in general, that um, I mean I'll pick on the venture world for a second here. 80 to 90 percent of I don't I don't know the number, so you know it's a, and it's over a time period, but 80 to 90 percent fail, um, don't make it, and you know the that success rate is really challenging. To do something that's going to be only succeed maybe 10 percent of the time, you know, 20, and, and the, I think that 20 percent would be where you essentially get the investors back their money. <laughs> you know, not really. You're not going to the moon or anything like that. So if you can do something that's lower risk, um, like you know a single person service company that you add one person at a time, um, I think your success rate will suddenly go up by you know many multiples. And suddenly you're talking about something that you have a 50, 60, 70% chance of being successful. This is why, I mean, the, the um, I can't remember the name, High Step. Uh, I'm really yes. excited about this because it's going to be really different when you have a, a model that's, has a high high rate of success in my opinion, especially once you give them support, like what you guys are planning on doing. So supporting them with both dollars and advice, you're going to take this to, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, literally 70, 80% can be successful. I totally agree. Versus, so, you know, our, our, especially like the SaaS world or typical software world, you know, you're, you're honestly in the 10%. I mean, <laughs> we want to continue to accelerate our entrepreneurial ecosystem in Northwest Arkansas. If we've been talking about the community's been talking about ramping up the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Northwest Arkansas. This seems like a great way to do it. Um, and for those listening who might want to know more about it, um, I interviewed uh, Josh Stanley about High Step, and um, you can find more information there. I also wrote a LinkedIn article uh, that's posted on my LinkedIn uh, web uh, profile that uh, 
talks about it in a little more detail. But but yeah, that's one of the neat things about professional services firms. You don't have to uh, invest so much like you would in a SaaS model to get it up and going. Yeah, and and I think people are um, the way, especially venture investments work, where you need. I mean, if you look at like the Kager sort of approach. Yeah, right? I, I talk about this a lot. So you know. Your exit, you know, how many multiples are you going to do? Ten times what you put in. That's one part of it. But it's also, Kager is also to the one over T. <laughs> you know, and that, so time, as T is here, time, time in the exponent means time is really, really important. And to have good returns, you need to have a very short time to get good Kager. Um, so what if people want a ten times exit, ten times exit is good if you do it in four years. Ten times exit is on 12 years. It's, right. it's probably minimal returns. So you need to do it quickly. And I think those couple things, particularly wanting really rapid growth, you know, growth at all costs or whatever you want to call that model, can be can really challenge success as well. So not only are you having to invest a lot of dollars before you really test out the market, um, you also have to it has to take off like a rocket ship where the investors are ever going to get a really good return. And I think a good return might be 10x and some number of years. So I think that's just really, really challenging. If you get started with a smaller amount of invested dollars, the the multiples are already easier, um, and then have a much higher probability of success, that I think the math works out almost better because when you'd say, I've got 10% are going to be amazing, 90% are going to be duds, and but it's going to be maybe more. You know, let's say they, they, they trade on multiples of revenue versus multiples of EBITDA. So you get maybe... Slightly less ex- smaller exits, many many more of them. <laughs> so, and they're they're higher higher probability of success. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Many many more of them in terms of the probability of success goes from say ten percent to potentially sixty percent. And so I think it's quite okay for your multiples to go down a little bit because they're trade on EBITDA. But I, my thinking here is that you know the idea, and I don't know why people don't do this more, that building a cohort of agencies that are get some investment dollars will return probably just as well as any other, um, you know, group, whether it's a SaaS investment, just because you'll have more successes than you otherwise would. I I don't think people will really, I was listening to a podcast the other day where they're like, oh yeah, the agent, you know, where they were kind of talking negatively about the agency model while they were interviewing an agency owner who did, I think, 200 million in revenue a year. And they're like, well, that's the worst model you can come up with. And he was like, what are you guys talking about? So I, mean, I think, so in general, I think especially in the software world and the, the venture world, agencies kind of get a bad rep as like not the best business model because it doesn't scale the right way or something like that. And I just, I don't agree. I think there's so many great agencies out there that are doing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Um, and then there's great software companies. And there's no reason I would argue that one is better than the other. Just somehow, I think venture and, you know, pretty in the software space is always attached to products and SaaS. Those are the kind of, that's the kind of golden goose these days for right. for venture returns. But agencies, I think, just as compelling. Well, Jared, thank you so much for taking time to visit with me today about this. It's been really interesting. I appreciate it. No problem. My, uh, my pleasure. Good to get to talk about this stuff. If you're finding value in this podcast, we greatly appreciate your support by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Additionally, following us on Apple and Spotify and leaving up to a five-star review would be immensely helpful. We welcome any feedback or questions related to the podcast, as well as suggestions for further topics and guests. You can leave your comments on our YouTube channel and rest assured that I will read each and every one of them. Please also take a moment to check out our podcast sponsors as they play a critical role in keeping this podcast running. For more information on specific topics, timestamps, or links to articles mentioned during the podcast, head over to mattwallerpodcast.com.